In case you've missed some of our videos, we've created this compilation just for you. Make sure to like and subscribe to this channel and enable the notification feature if you're bored, want something to listen to in the background, or want to learn about odd teas so you'll know where to go the next time you can't sleep. You can recommend videos to others by leaving their timestamp in the comments area. Let's begin. What's the stupidest real men don't blank you've ever heard? Story 1. Read the instructions. My girlfriend doesn't read any instructions, then wonders why it doesn't fit together properly, etc. I was brought up on Lego sets. I read these stupid instructions. I'm an engineer. I not only want to read the instructions, I want to read the entire installation process before I start anything. I want to know the entire path before me and not just stumble into, oh, they weren't very clear about this before, I needed to do X here in order to do Y now kind of issues. My wife does not want to read the instructions. She wants to open the package and have the thing installed minutes later. There's no time to read and analyze her schedule. It very often leads to conflict. My ex was the very same way. Stop wasting time and hurry up. It'll only take a minute to put together. She was very much like that with other things, too. She wants me to tile the dining room floor. First time attempting to tile. But I only have a couple hours available? It won't take that long. You just lay the tiles down in that cement stuff. Just go faster. I had to stop halfway through to go to work so she made our 16-year-old daughter try to finish the job. Mind you, this woman had never assembled or completed any kind of DIY project successfully in her life. Oh, I can identify with this one. I am a person who does not like to do something confidently or at all unless there is a, a clear set of instructions or plans. I do not want to mess something up, especially something where I paid a lot of money for all the essential ingredients or components beforehand. Story 2. I've heard real men don't drink tea. Is this a, an American versus European thing? It actually reminds me of a funny story. This guy was going to his girlfriend's house to meet her cop father for the first time. The guy came from a pretty privileged background, and he knew his girl's father already disliked him, based on the fact alone. When we got there, the dad offered him hot tea in a cup without a handle. Dude was like, I could tell this was a test of some sort, so I picked up that scalding hot cup and just held it, slowly slipping away. I could literally feel my fingerprints burning off, but I held that cup like a man. And I passed the test. Her dad loosened up a little after that. I suffered some serious burns, but well worth it. What's in the cup? Pain. I hold gum jabber at your neck. The gum jabber. Edit. I came back to this many hours later and laughed so hard I almost wet my still suit. What a fan base. T is the mind killer. T is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my T. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the burning flesh is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I usually prefer tea over coffee. Or at least I will only drink coffee after I've finished doing all my voiceover stuff. Caffeine and coffee can actually really dry up your throat and make it hard to speak. And even hot tea isn't that good. Usually lukewarm tea. Or, yeah, not even cold tea. Just a little tip. Story three. Sleep on their stomachs. I agree, because if your butt is facing upward and just looks all fat, round, and jiggly there in the middle of the night, the devil might get tempted to either eat it or pound it with his 20-inch tool, so it's better to sleep with your butt against a mattress to avoid tempting any supernatural creature that might be lurking around, like a werewolf... Because getting smashed by a werewolf isn't only gay, it's also furry behavior and real men don't partake in furry activities like getting a massive anal orgasm from a thick, knotted werewolf tool. 
<laughs> Edit. I don't know what devil possessed me to write such an oddly specific and, and spicy, gay, sarcastic joke, but I'm sorry for making anyone picture a big werewolf making a real man have an anal orgasm through a big, thick, knotted tool. I should also probably get off the internet for a couple of hours and go touch some grass. Dude, you need to go touch sanity. That's what you need to do. Edit 2. Guys, what the hell? I'm in awe of all the awards. Thank you all so much. I'm glad this dumb thing I wrote made you all laugh. Thank you all again. I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you. I've never had a more successful comment than this one. Thank you. Well, hell, now I have to sleep on my stomach. <laughs> I want a detailed report on my desk by sunup festival. <laughs> That what have you ever seen a comment that you know was just inspired by the question and they just the the words just flew from your fingers onto the keyboard? That comment was it. That was and my that was the first time I read that. I read these scripts usually sight unseen, so plus I have to censor myself as I go along. <laughs> Story four. Drink fruity cocktails. Dude, my cocktail has five spirits in it. It's way more alcohol than your 3.x% alcohol by volume beer, and it tastes nice. Tiki drinks are pretty and have a heroic amount of booze in them. Anyone who thinks that should go pound a zombie cocktail, then come back and apologize while thanking me for getting them really buzzed on one drink. A friend of mine was drinking a hurricane in a bar one time, and some big burly biker-looking dude with a beer started giving him grief. My friend replied, at least I'm drinking liquor. The biker stopped, thought about it, then ordered himself a hurricane. A couple minutes later, another biker gave the first one grief, and the first biker responded, at least I'm drinking liquor, and high-fived my friend. I hate how that started, but it ended up sort of wholesome, I guess. Is it bad that the most remarkable thing about the story is that the random biker harassing a stranger actually considered a different viewpoint and then accepted it? Hey, sometimes awful viewpoints are implanted at a young age and then never questioned. Being willing to question and change those viewpoints is an unambiguously good thing, and more important than whether or not someone's had an awful belief in the past. Story 5. I was told that real men never look at their nails with their palms down and would only ever look at their nails with their palms up and fingers curled. I gotta wonder how secure in your masculinity you've gotta be to spend time even thinking about the right way to look at your nails. Both seem equally girly to me. When I was a kid, I had other girls do this test to me and declare I was in reality a boy. Then they refused to explain any further and ran away. I remember asking a girl to a dance. We were good friends and she was straight, but only ever in relationships for a week at most, she said maybe then told me my fingernail was bleeding. When I looked, I did the palm down thing because that just felt more natural in that moment, and she promptly told me I was too feminine for her because men should look at their fingernails with their palms up. That confused me because I've always associated women filing their nails palms up and had never thought about this before that moment. I'm 30 now and it still confuses me. Look at your nails whatever way lets you see them properly in the moment. What the hell is this masculine-feminine junk? No, my nail was bleeding. She was testing me. Story 6. Don't help do women's work around the house, i.e. helping with little kids, baths, dishes, laundry, etc. I'm 46 and have no memories whatsoever of my dad helping my mom around the house or any of his brothers helping their wives with the kids or house stuff. Or hell, being silly and playing with us as kids with affection. I know gender roles were strong back in the 70s, 80s, 90s even, but man, you have to admit, men have come a long way in a short amount of time with typically not treating our wives as second-class citizens that we keep around to do the dirty work around the house that men shouldn't do. My wife has a great job and makes more than me. I get home before her. I hate doing laundry, but I love cleaning the kitchen and cooking our meals, so there's a nice dinner when she gets home. I help with diapers, shuttling the kids around to appointments. We're a team. That's the way it always should have been. No woman's duties or men's duties. 
and I as a man refuse to help her with woman's work. You're a teen. She's your ally. I hate when self-proclaimed alpha men in my family give me a hard time for being an equal partner with my wife. I agree with that last part. Two people are working together to build a home. And usually that means both people are working as well. But stuff at the home has to get done. Cleaning, cooking, taking care of the kids. Some people might be good at it than others. Some men might be better with taking care of the kids. Some women might be better. You have to get together and figure out what to do and get it done together as a team. All right, had to look up a euphemism for this one because it's got a swear word. Here we go. Which profession has the most shook up people in it? Story one, prison guards. Used to play video games with a guy from Texas that was a guard at some prison. He divorced his wife, who I had also become friends with, so that he could profess his love for me. I turned him down, and he told me if I ever went to Texas and he found out, he'd make sure I wouldn't leave the state. Wow. Couldn't handle the rejection, so he resorted to a fatality threat. What a real piece of work. Don't be so quick to judge. It could have also been a kidnapping or physical slave threat. Or accusing her of some crime and having her arrested and put on probation in the state of Texas. With him being a prison guard, it's likely that he has buddies that are cops in the area. I've always kind of figured that cops react to prison guards the way that military react to cops. Hey, Jones, this guy says his job is just like ours. Ha ha ha. My ex was a CO at one point, and he quit because he couldn't stand how horrid the others were to the prisoners. He made the point that if you treat them all like animals, how do you expect to rehabilitate prisoners? He wouldn't tell me a lot because he said some of the things he witnessed were vile. He tried to be kind to the prisoners, not to the point of allowing them to run over him, but to show that he saw them as human beings. My ex isn't even that great of a person, but I'll give him this one. My aunt has been in and out of the prison system the last few years. It's a long story, and while she did deserve to serve time, she's not a bad person. She's a broken woman who lost her child, fell into illicit substances to control her grief, and made some really bad choices. The COs, she told us, are about her horrid. They look down on all of them and treat the woman even lesser than the men. They would treat her like she was an unaliver or something, steal their mail, and wouldn't allow them to seek medical attention when they needed it. I don't know why, in America of all places, we have allowed our prison systems to become so deplorable. I get that they're to be punished, but they're also there to be rehabilitated and returned to society as a more capable person. But they don't because the prisons are just making them feel like they're nothing but trash. There's a reason that there's such a high rate of offenders returning to prison, because they're short of being tortured and are never given the resources or tools to get their life together. Not all prisoners are unalivers, physical violators, etc. Many are good people who made a bad decision and probably when they were in a bad position in their lives. Edit. I'm getting a lot of responses about my part saying in America of all places, and yes, I realize our history is not good. Trust me, I'm one of the people constantly screaming about the lies we were raised on, etc. I'm not trying to pretend that we didn't have slaves. That we still aren't fighting against racism, classism, homophobia, and more. It's very harmful to ignore the atrocities that your country has committed. We should acknowledge and try to be better. I just want to add, almost every single country in the world has some type of history they aren't proud of. It's not just America. The problem with many Americans is they want to ignore our history and pretend we're perfect in every way, and that's simply not true. It was more of a point that, not being a third world country, we have almost comparable prisons. To be fair, I don't know about a ton of prisons in other countries and need to educate myself more, but I know some other countries have much better prison systems and such, where rehabilitation is the focus. Please, don't break down an entire three-paragraph comment discussing the conditions of our prisons into five words that can be taken out of context. I know America has issues. Most of us do know. 
We aren't the worst country in the world, but we are far from the best, too. Our history is covered in... blood, as is most of our world history. It's just sad that humans, for all of our achievements, still don't know how to be decent to each other. I can agree with all of this. You can treat a person with respect and dignity, but still enforce the rules. I've had inmates protect me from other inmates, especially when I was pregnant. It's disgusting having to watch him protect over a child violator, but you should still be able to do your job without being on their level. I think it's just what you're exposed to. If you're exposed to criminals all of your life or in all of your career, that's what you're going to see in everything outside of it. It's what you're conditioned to. Sort of like the person that reads romance novels or reads certain types of biographies or a certain type of action novel. They're going to see those kind of situations in the outside. They can make connections in their real life, but hopefully they don't act on them. Uh, <laughs> the action novels, not the romance necessarily. Story two. People I've met who are life coaches seem to be the most wackadoodle people ever. I've had two close friends in my life become life coaches. Calling them wackadoodle is close to the truth. They are, but in my opinion, there's more to it. They want to help people but have no discerning skills outside of reading too much fad, fitness, slash self-help literature and being charismatic. Also are both fairly wealthy but didn't make the money themselves. I think their heart is in the right place, but the wealth, crunchy granola bars, and pseudo-intellectualism many from self-help books melted into their brains. As an old professor of mine once said, life coaches are people who want to be psychologists without going through the work of actually becoming a psychologist. Me being a psychology student feels that so much. My ex once confronted me about the difference between a coach and a psychologist and I felt really offended. It's not about feeling superior, nothing like that, but putting yourself through the path to really learn how things work in an organized way. Not just what matters to you, not only giving advice. Ethics exist. There's regulations. Also, psychology is not only about helping people out in their decisions and being healthy. There's research, teaching, social work, education, etc., Psychotherapy is a tiny category. Uh, also, the science behind it. It's always good to know what you're talking about and who came up with that theory based on what. Their opinions are just as valid as yours, science. Sarcasm. Isaac Asimov. There is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there has always been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, where nearly all the manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide, almost without noticing, back into superstition and darkness. The dumbing down of American is most evident in the slow decay of substantive content in the enormously influential media. The 30-second sound bites, now down to 10 seconds or less, lowest common denominator programming, credulous presentations on pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration of ignorance. Carl Sagan, The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, published 1996. These men saw it all. It's been like that for a long time here. Will Rogers, early 20th century, U.S. entertainer humorist, noted this in a century ago. I guess our country holds the record for dumbness. The Pope spoke to the world this morning in three languages, and we didn't understand one of them. 
but the minute he finished and the local stations got back to selling corn salve and pyrea toothpaste, we're right up in our intellectual alley again. H.L. Mencken, U.S. reporter, literary critic, author, uh, uh, editor, author of the early 20th century. The most erroneous assumption is to the effect that the aim of public education is to fill the young of the species with knowledge and awaken their intelligence, and so make them fit to discharge the duties of citizenship in an enlightened and independent manner. Nothing could be further from the truth. The aim of public education is not to spread enlightenment at all. It's simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level, to breed and train a standardized citizenry, to put down dissent and originality. That is the aim in the United States, whether the pretensions of politicians, pedagogues, and other such montebanks, and that is the aim everywhere else. To those people, I'd like to add a couple of others that I think were very prophetic in their work, uh, comedian Bill Hicks, and especially George Carlin and his great quote. It's called The American Dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. What's an actual victimless crime? Story one. As an ER nurse, I give a lot of stuff away to patients against the rules or advise them where they can get it cheaper. Big hospitals have more money than God, but want me to send you home with one or two wound supplies for a wound that will take four weeks to heal. Forget that. Here's a box of 50 for your purse. I never gave that to you. Hey, you need crutches, and here they are. But first, before you sign that, you get these. These crutches are $1,000. The same or better are on Amazon for $50 or less. I'm not telling you how to live your life, but I can offer you a free wheelchair ride out to your son's car. You could argue that the hospital is the victim here, I'm telling you that the hospital gets a discount on supplies and marks them up a thousand percent to sell to those going through an emergency. Who's the real victim? Edit. Appreciate all the support. Don't take this the wrong way, but I hope I never have the pleasure of taking care of any of you. Stay healthy, people, and keep living your life to the best you can. To those saying I could get fired for this, I appreciate the concern. I can almost guarantee I will one day be fired for this. It's worth it to me. I will get another job in a different ER and continue my work. Regarding the people saying I'm contributing to the problem, the problem is the USA healthcare model. Everything from insurance to CEOs. If my treatment and proper care of the individual is contributing to the problem, frankly, I don't think I care, to be honest. I will continue. Lastly, various arguments have been made as to if this is a victimless crime or not. I don't disagree with some, but it's the closest thing I have to answer the question. Apologies if it doesn't 100% fit. Stay beautiful, people. So this just happened to me in the past month. I was out of state visiting my kids and had to go to the ER because I did something to my shoulder, was in a ton of pain, couldn't lift my arm, etc., etc. Got to the ER and realize uh, that I didn't have my insurance card with me. No problem, just bill me. I'll file it with my insurance after I get the bill. Note, my insurance has an out-of-network ER visit set at $500. So get home, a few weeks later, get the bill from the ER. Oh, we noticed that you didn't have insurance on file. So we do understand that hospital bills can be hard, so we've given you the uninsured discount of $250. What? So if I file with my insurance, I'll end up paying twice what the hospital is going to charge me for paying in cash. Guess what I did? We recently moved from an apartment to a house. Due to some complications and delays, I couldn't be there for the morning of moving day, so my wife would have to handle the movers getting stuff from our apartment, furniture only. We moved all the boxes ourselves, but she didn't feel confident handling it and asked her parents to come down. Long story short, it's a rainy day, and my father-in-law decides the first thing he should do upon entering the new house with wet shoes on is head into the basement, where he proceeds to slip and fall down literally every stair. Yes, there is a railing. He gets to the hospital, 
and without thinking, tells the doctor that he fell at his daughter's new house. He wasn't malicious, he just wasn't thinking. I, of course, want them to be okay. He had to have surgery, but is otherwise fine now. But embracing for his insurance to sue our new homeowner's insurance, making my life hell for the foreseeable future. Except, Total Bro Doctor lists undisclosed location as source of the fall, saving my butt thousands upon thousands of dollars in future costs against my insurance. What the hell is wrong with your country? I mean, like, yeah, nice doctor, but why on earth is it even possible for an insurance company to sue your homeowner's insurance? Like, what the hell? Not that it's right, but the idea is that it's our responsibility. So the medical insurance goes after our homeowner's insurance since we're technically at fault. It's a stupid total system. I think I remembered reading a story a few years ago where a girl fell at her aunt's house and it caused a rift between the family because the girl's medical insurance was forced to sue the aunt when she broke her arm. Reminds me of when we used to hunt on a nice farmer's property and always asked him first. We took a couple of years off hunting and when we went back, he said he couldn't let people do that anymore. Some guy did the same thing but brought an ATV, wrecked it on the farmer's property, and sued the farmer because he got injured. Like, bro, you did it to yourself. My dad, and before he passed, my grandfather, has lifetime hunting rights on a family friend's property. Side note, I have the rights for life too, and I don't hunt. He just went ahead and gave me the same rights when I was like five. One of those things on the paperwork states that if we're injured on the property due to our own negligence or something that the owner has zero control over, then we can't sue him. Not that we would want to. I think I can only fall on him if it's something he directly causes. Not sure what that could be, to be honest. I guess maybe if he left dangerous tools or equipment out that that would cause injury. I totally agree on this. I once had an injury one of the few times I was hospitalized, and the whole time, you know, I was not in a good financial situation, and this hospital pretty much covered it all. I mean, and they couldn't even figure out what was wrong with me, but they ended up healing me up, and kind of even had me stay a little bit longer just so they could feed me a few more meals to make sure I was eating right. Story 2 Sleeping in your car when you're too drunk and can't drive. Many years ago, there was a big to-do in Maryland because cops kept harassing truckers to move on when they had pulled over to catch some sleep. Do cops not realize that trucks have recording devices known as tachographs installed to monitor the driving times, breaks, and rest periods of individual drivers? Unless that's just Europe. American cops tend not to give a care. Just don't sleep in the driver's seat. Can still get a DUI just for being behind the wheel, even in a parked car. Edit. And apparently in a lot of places, just for being inside the car and having possession of the keys. Which is nuts. One time I got drunk at a party and had planned to just stay at the house because it was my friend's party. But after I got drunk and it was like 1am, they informed me I couldn't stay the night. So the friend I came with and I just slept in my car on the street in a permit-parking-only spot. I slept in the driver's seat and my friend slept in the passenger seat. I woke up around 6 a.m. to someone knocking on my window. It was a police officer and he said I should be sleeping in my car in a permit-parking-only section. I told him the situation and made sure to point out the keys were in the cup holder, not in the ignition and he was really nice and really good about it. Just thanked me for not drinking and driving and told me to take my time sobering up. I slept for another hour or so and then woke up again and drove home. It was a good moment with a cop. In many states, you can get a DOI for having the keys on you and being asleep in the back seat. A buddy of mine beat that charge by putting his keys in the trunk and just locked the doors from the inside. He got woken up by a cop and was given the tests. He was too drunk to finish them. Still, he was asked where his keys were, and he said, in the trunk. I can't get to them, 
unless I hit the button under the dash, which he was still too drunk to point out. The cop let him go back to sleep. Hell, I just got checkmated by a drunk guy. Fair enough. Have a good night. That's awful. You over-imbibe and do the right thing by not driving home and then get arrested for being smart and conscientious? I guess the saying no good deed goes unpunished really is true. Yep. Isn't it great? <laughs> Too drunk and spend the night sleeping in your car? Ticket. The best was when my dad was drunk and called me to pick him up. I told the bar manager what was going on and if it was cool to leave his car there and get it in the morning. Guy says, sure, I take dad home. Next day we went to get it and the bar owner had it towed and it cost us nearly $500 to get it back. What even is the right thing to do? Because you seem to get punished no matter what. That bar manager is a total jerk. I don't know how many times at my old jo uh, job, bar, we let people leave their cars if they were too drunk. We called whoever, no taxis in that area, and Uber didn't exist, to come and get them. We had a bowl for left-behind cars to put the keys in. Tagged them with the person's name, paper and tape, and initialized it with date and time. They usually showed up the next day. Only after a week, sometimes two for regulars, would we tow it. Our owner gave them that amount of time because he knew the people. Some were alcoholics and struggling and possibly forgot where they parked their car, and he didn't want to mess them over. The, the, there's various scenarios to why he gave that amount of time, but yeah, that manager you dealt with was a total jerk. I'm sorry you and your dad went through that. For me, it wasn't. I, I didn't drink, but a lot of times when I was driving, doing ride share, Sometimes you just worked a long night and you were tired. You just wanted to at least nap, or I wanted to at least nap and not be a danger of driving drowsy on the highway. I've had some cops knock on my car when I was taking a nap like that, and when I explained it that way, they were fine. I never really got any guff for it. Why did you get fired? Story 1. I talked my way into a job at a software company when they put a hiring notice in a local paper. I had no idea what the software did. I still don't. They hired me as a trainer, and no one ever explained what the product was. I did a few weeks where I was trained on the software, but literally none of it ever made sense to me. It was like they were speaking gibberish. One day I showed up, a lady I had never seen before gave me a check and walked me out to the parking lot. No one even ever said, you're fired or anything. It's one of the strangest things that ever happened to me. Ah, I see they tried to teach you SAP. <laughs> SAP is the most unintuitive, user-unfriendly BS I've ever used. Just visited the website and I left without getting any idea of what they do. What my company uses it for is inventory management, creating and processing purchase orders for different vendors, various project management tasks, stuff like that. But imagine that it was built by a group of undergraduate computer science students, and they were specifically told not to worry about making it look modern or user-friendly. So like, yes, it works, but you're going to need someone who already knows it to show you how to do things. And if you're trying to figure out something on your own, you might end up breaking something. I'm sure other companies have versions that are easier to use, but I work for a Fortune 500 company, so I'm surprised at how much ours sucks. That reminds me of a time that I got escorted out early from a group interview. The company was a little suspicious altogether. The interviewer was even more sus because he was just wearing all black, polo and jeans, and was absolutely decked out in gold jewelry. Looked like he stepped out of a mob movie or something. Sounds like you were interviewing for a pyramid scheme and asking questions they didn't like. I walked out of one of those before actually meeting anyone once. I knew what it was and didn't want to go to it. My parents, however, aren't the sharpest sometimes, and they really believed the thing that came in the mail saying a 17-year-old could get a sales job making over 100 k a year. 
The interview was literally in an abandoned former hotel, with printer paper signs directing you what room to go to. I walked in, and there were a bunch of kids waiting who all looked younger than me, like 13, all wearing their middle school choir best of a way too large white button-up and baggy khakis. I turned around and walked out, spent an hour at the local music store, and told my parents the interview went badly. In my experience, places doing a group interview are a major red flag. One place I applied for some kind of data analysis slash software-related advertisement, I showed up and there's 30 other freshly graduated idiots like myself in suits. They pull three of us back at a time to do a group interview, and the owner of the company reveals that the job is door-to-door sales and that in order to succeed, we must be willing to work ourselves to the bone. No excuses to not show up even if your family members are in the hospital. I told him straight up I actually gave a care about my family, and he kicked me out of the interview right then and there. The other two guys actually looked legitimately kind of scared. I walked out with a smile on my face feeling bad for whichever guys ended up accepting a job there. Freshly graduated idiots, thanks for the cackle. I was also one of those idiots who got tricked into going in for an interview where the office lobby looked like an ER waiting room, absolutely chock full of suckers like me. During the group interview, they didn't ever actually even say it was door-to-door sales. It was stated in the pamphlet they'd handed out to us and on the PowerPoint. Almost like it wasn't said out loud at any point that it was door-to-door, then we'd never actually catch on that it was door-to-door sales, like the Neanderthals they took us to be. I think I was only in one job interview ever that was a group thing. And it was depressing. Them just talking to you, just this one person talking to everyone there, and it was like a phone sales interview. And all it was was just telling you everything you couldn't do. And for the pay that they were offering, I think even at any pay they were offering, it wasn't worth it for that list alone. Story two. I was denied a raise by HR after consistently working 60 to 70 hour weeks and my VP, who had supported and requested the raise for me, told me to stop putting in the extra time, work my 40, and spend the extra time applying to new jobs. Within a month, a meeting was called to mutually part ways because my work wasn't getting done. I was gratified to learn that they had to hire two people to do my job after I left. Edit. Sucks to see how much this resonates with people who have been in similar situations. I left this job back in 2015, thankfully. The VP is no longer there either, and good for him. I hear this story often in IT career questions. It's weird, but I guess in IT there aren't always logistical blocks like some other careers. Payroll might be done for our current period, but enhancements to the payroll software can continue ad nauseum. What's sad is that most of these stories skip the part where the VP needs to be pushing for you to justify this level of effort. The second he recognizes he didn't have the power to get you what he deserved, he said, don't give it to him for free and get yourself what you can anywhere. That's a rare level of grace now. I encountered a similar situation, and my bum boss just said, keep trying your best, maybe they'll notice. I said I'd rather spend that energy looking for work elsewhere. But that felt good, knowing they had to pay two people for what you did all by yourself. Glad you got out of there, though. I had a friend who was working like that, and I was convinced to find a new job. He did and the new company was going to pay him four times what he was getting paid. He tells his boss, and they came back with a counteroffer that matched. He told me he was probably going to sit stay. I said, forget that. They knew your worth and intentionally underpaid you for years. Anyway, he treated me to dinner for several months after he took the new job. 
I said forget that they knew your worth and intentionally underpaid you for years. There's also the risk of retribution. If you take a counteroffer, they now still know you're looking elsewhere and might make your life miserable if you choose to stay. Maybe this is just the millennial in me, but if I was working 70 hours a week, denied a raise and had my position filled by two people, I wouldn't have felt good or gratified. I'd have been ticked. Wasted my time, wasted my life, wasted my potential, refused to pay me even half of what they're now paying. That company and everyone involved in the process of denying that race should be themselves fired for being jerkwads. The only thing this story conjures in my mind is that scene from Futurama where they show all the Fox executives making a joke about canceling and bring the show back. Story, oh, oh man, before I go on to that, very true. If you get another offer, no, don't go back and tell the other people. I mean, this sounds like it was a bad environment anyway. I don't know what the reason this person had for staying, but if they found a better job, just take it. Don't tell them anything. There is, that one person said, there's always a possibility for retribution. Or they may try to counter-offer you, but they don't offer anything in writing so they can always renege on their deal. They'll try to find some way to keep you at the pay they have been paying you. Story 3. I went to the emergency room instead of work. Came back with an ER note, and they said, We won't be needing that. Can you come with us? I was 18, and it was my first full-time job. I had pneumonia and a doctor's note. Came back to work a week later, wheezing and puffing an inhaler. Got fired the next week. Joke's on them. I still got unemployment benefits when they tried to fight it. Doctor's notes are good things. Some of the companies literally fight every claim, whether they're valid or not. It's disgusting, and there should be penalties for such companies. I went to a funeral and took the three paid days off and called off a fourth because it was my grandmother and we were very close. They called it job abandonment. Earlier this year, I was hospitalized for a full work week for a miscarriage that had a lot of complications. My direct boss, a woman, was completely empathetic, and even though I'm a one-person team, she encouraged me to take off all the time that I wanted slash needed. So I did, and took an extra week off after being released from the hospital to just process some things and physically recover. I needed blood transfusions and multiple surgeries beyond just a DNC. Also, couldn't walk around much and had almost no energy for anything except sleep. Anyway, about a month later, revenue reports came in for the previous month, and there was a massive drop in revenue for my team, correlating directly with the period I was hospitalized and in recovery. While I was out, no one at work covered for me. So that work just didn't get done, and it led to a big zero dollars for most of the month. My boss's boss, a man, then sent an angry accusatory email to me with my direct boss CC'd. They demanded to know why my team had done so poorly for the previous month and what I was going to do to step it up and make sure it never happened again because whatever mistake I had made was completely unacceptable. Corporate America at its absolute finest. Please tell me you walked out of that office and went straight to the labor board. I was fired over a miscarriage because while I was miscarrying, I got a DNC, and the paperwork said it was an elective procedure. I had been miscarrying for over a week and needed one, but it's considered an elective procedure, so I was fired. I don't know about that part, but I was actually in a job once I had fallen off my bike and fractured my wrist. You might see the scar there. I had to have surgery, but I had a doctor's note saying I could still operate a computer with one hand for what I was doing, and they still used that to justify cutting my pay in half, and it was already bad as it is. And all the while, they, they were saying, well, I talked to my lawyers. They thought they were doing me a favor. They were trying to sell it that way. It was awful. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. What's something you don't think you'll ever do again in your life? Story 2. 
Peruvian marching powder. The C word, you know. Edit. I have not done it for over 30 years. I was hooked for a couple of years in Florida when it was everywhere and dirt cheap in the 1980s. The thought of it now nauseates me. Yep. I got asked about this from a friend not too long ago. She knew how far I went down that road. She asked if I ever got the urge. It's been like 15 years. I do. But the difference is now it wouldn't be fun. It would be sad and only in service of an addiction. I lost a good friend a couple of years ago from this stuff. Heart attack at 40. I don't want to join him. Same. It started out fun, but it turned into something else altogether. There's a reason you don't see a lot of 40 or 50 plus year old sea heads. Either unalive or smartened up. Never going back. I remember doing four to five grams of that stuff over a three-day weekend. This was about a six-month bender of using every day in varying amounts. A few years ago, and afterwards my dealer of all people was the one who told me to take it easy, and I think in that moment it just became clear that I had a problem. Took months of relapsing here and there to get clean. I've never experienced anything else like it and the hold it has over you. Still get the urge, especially when I'm having a phase of depression, which is a whole other thing. I just keep reminding myself about how messed up I was mentally in the midst of it and how much money I wasted on it to keep myself in check. The worst part is, I used to love going to festivals, but I'm afraid now because I'm certain I'll relapse in that environment. Good to know not all dealers are totally callous mongrels. Glad you got a grip on it before it's too late. I still get new number text from a lot of my old uh, dope dealers. Being that I have multiple years clean now, I always respond with that and maybe good luck. Every single one has been congratulatory and told me to keep up the good work, etc. Really caught me off guard the first time. But it actually amazes me that I've never had someone try to push something onto me after that. I was a lot younger in the 80s. I never tried this stuff either. And I remember watching all the movies. It was just all the bad guys and all the villains that did substances like this. And they their lives ended up pretty badly, you know, especially like RoboCop, especially with how that guy's life ended up. Not the not RoboCop, the executive. If you know the movie, you know the scene I'm talking about. Story three, Skydive. Biggest rush, but once is enough. My wife went tandem skydiving, and her main chute didn't open, and they had to use the reserve. Then about a year later, her friend called her and said one of the instructors they had gone with had perished in an accident. Holy hell on a swivel stick. What if the reserve doesn't work either? You see, this is what scares me poopless about skydiving. Friends have done it and always try to get me to join, but I'm like, nope, because I already know if someone's chute isn't going to open or malfunction, it's going to be mine. Like I already know, that's just how it is, and I don't particularly want to know how it feels to bounce my face off the surface of the earth right now. There's always a chance the second doesn't work too. However, if I remember correctly, the second chute is required to be packed by an FAA certified member and they have to be reinspected every six months or any time they're used. The initial chute is packed in the house. The two places I've been to get set up right where they're packing the chute so you can see the process. <laughs> Here, look at how well this guy is packing your chute. See how he gets the W-fold perfect and ensures the strings have a maximum 6% twist torsion? I've had friends that try skydiving. This one, I would try once. I probably would not try it again, but I would try it once. I do have a very big fear of heights. I haven't been on roller coasters for a long time, but that was the main reason I didn't get on those. Story 4. Give birth. Giving birth seems so painful and traumatic. I'm surprised there aren't more one and dones. For me, it was being pregnant. If it was just giving birth, I could do that again. Your body knows what's coming, and it's honestly fine. I mean, it sucks, but it's fine. For me, being pregnant was nine plus months of absolute misery, and I never had it in me to do it all again. 
The postpartum period sucks too, and I'm very vain and basically never want to look like hell. That being said, I probably would have done it again if my husband wanted another baby, but he waited until I was like 38 to suggest another. Get the hell out. <laughs> Our kid is in high school. OMG, right? I kept saying that when I was pregnant. Birth is like one day. Pregnancy was nine months of misery with a new symptom every day. Nausea? Old news. Back pain? Aight. Restless legs? What the hell? Oh, you got restless legs under control? Here's some reflux. I had the little mentioned pregnancy rhinitis. I had a completely stuffed nose my entire pregnancy. Should have bought stock in breathe right strips. Story 5. Get Married I lost my husband to cancer seven years ago when he was 48 and I was 45. I can't imagine ever loving someone that much again. I can relate. My husband passed away unexpectedly when I was 38 and he was 41. That was three and a half years ago, and I can't imagine getting married again, but my kids are still young, so who knows what the future will bring when I'm an empty nester. My mother and three of my siblings perished when I was young. My father was in his mid-twenties. He remarried at 45, I believe. I've never seen him happy till then in my life. I will say, as his kid, I have nothing but happiness for his newfound love. I'm so sorry for your loss. I wish you and your children all the best. My mom passed four years ago, and my dad is still heartbroken every day. My mom passed away 17 years ago. At that time, my dad still wears his wedding ring and has not dated. He says there's no point as he could never again have what he had with my mom. Aw, such a blessing and a curse to love someone that's no longer here. Story 6. Horse. Another illicit substance, it's the H word, you know. Been sober since November 17th, 2018, and my life is better than it's ever been. Edit. Thank you to everyone who has given me updates and awards. I've read through and been able to identify with so many who have commented. When you're stuck in that lifestyle, you honestly believe that you can't survive without it. Now looking back, I don't know how I survived so long with it. Extremely lucky. Yeah, I had a great uncle who couldn't kick the habit and perished from complications at 62. To be fair, he did almost every substance, so making it to 62 is an achievement of its own. Same here. May 14th, 2015. My date fell on Mother's Day this year. I never would have ever become a mother if I didn't get clean. I feel beyond lucky to have made it out the other side because most do not. We do recover. I am lucky that my biggest thing growing up was when I lived in Vegas, I did some drinking and I only stopped because other people had always paid for the drinks and they stopped paying. I'm just so grateful that I was never lured or fallen into one of the rabbit holes of any of these illicit substances I've been reading about. There's just way too many bad stories. Too many. Story 7. Lining up early in the day at a concert with general admission tickets so I can get to the front row. Then never leaving that spot for the entire concert so I can hold my spot while the main act performs. See Metallica 24 times live. Always did this in the early years until I realized you can still enjoy it just as much further away where you can breathe. <laughs> I got sick at a concert inside an arena one time. The acoustics sitting in the bathroom were the best I've ever heard at a concert. A pair of earplugs might make it so much better if you don't want to be stuck in the bathroom. <laughs> I prefer the Eargasm brand made for concerts. These work. Last concert I went to, my friend's ears were ringing and I was totally fine afterwards. Story 8. I did the Wild Cave Tour at Mammoth Cave where it's like a six-hour caving adventure, and I'll never do it again. I didn't think I was claustrophobic, but crawling through space is so narrow you have to lay flat on your stomach and shimmy your body with no room to even lift your head or turn around? Never again. Some of these areas you crawl through are so tiny that they actually have height and chest circumference limits so people don't get stuck. Nightmare scenario. I would never. Same here. Forget that. Whose idea of fun is this? Story 9. Pick up and snuggle the kids. They're grown now with kids of their own. My 17-year-old was having a rough time, and she asked me to come cuddle. I've never moved so fast in my life. She hasn't asked for a cuddle in years. Aw, my 3-year-old told me she didn't want to cuddle at bedtime last night, so this made me slightly teary. Hope the cuddle made her feel better. Meh. 
Sometimes three-year-olds do that, but that doesn't mean it's over yet. Have hope. My ten-year-old is five foot two, so rapidly becoming difficult to pick up. Now he likes to try to pick me up. Kids are weird. I don't know how to feel about the fact that a ten-year-old is my height. Story 10. Hopefully, chemo. In remission for three years now, still going strong. Edit. Thank you for all the love. I feel that, man. Got three more treatments to do before I'm free. But I'm in remission. Today is my four-year cancer anniversary. Stage three at age 25. Here's to many more negative scans for both of us. Let's absolutely go, science girl. Negative scans forever. I feel ya. Stage three at 21. We got this. Story 11. Ride a roller coaster. Y'all take care of your back because when it goes, your life choices are reduced. Yep. I've got multiple spasms just from moving the wrong way. I won't even go to an amusement park anymore. Apparently, there is a proper way to do everything. I know all the improper ways to sneeze, cough, stand, turn, look, laugh, breathe, sit, lay down, get up, and hokey pokey. You're supposed to turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. What's the worst response to you're under arrest? Story 1. No, I'm a sovereign citizen and you are overstepping your authority because of maritime law or something. You're a crook, Captain Hook. We had a sovereign citizen go to prison yesterday. He didn't see it coming at all. He always comes to court like, ha, checkmate. I'm sure he was shocked his nonsense didn't work. I live next door to one. He had several insightful bits of wisdom. I don't remember most of them, but the one that always stands out, probably because of how adamantly he proclaimed it, was that white people are all Asian. That's why we call them Caucasians. He very much liked his wordplay and would enunciate words repeatedly to get his point across and validate whatever wild stuff he believed based on the content of the word. Also, very much about the people versus corporation distinction, as his person was so-and-so and his corporation was so-and-so some different name. His corporation was one hell of a troublemaker, tell you what. He was also in and out of jail for driving without a license, which was fine because he made his living being a rapper. <laughs> and by made a living being a rapper, I mean he made rap songs and lived off his girlfriend's wages. He walked with a cane, but it was fine because he was very proud of being shot and looked forward to anyone asking him why he had it. Apparently, the dude that owned a store he was robbing had a gun and blew out his leg. I later found out from his girlfriend that the gun he used for the robbery was fake and it wasn't his first rodeo. He would often get angry, but the only thing you had to do if he was ticked at you was bow up to him. He'd back the hell off and show up to apologize later. If you didn't stand up to him, man or woman... He would talk stuff about you until you did. I'm sure there's more, but I just can't spend any more time reminiscing. Dude was a trip. I totally misread that last part. I thought you were saying you had to bow to him. Kind of like how the Japanese bow to each other as a greeting slash sign of respect. I was just imagining him throwing plates and having a hissy fit. Then you just bow and he just instantly stops. I was confused, but I also found it funny. The mental image of him being essentially a five-year-old who then transforms into a sophisticated gentleman just from you bowing had me cackling. I'm still confused. I've never heard the term bow up to before, and I'm not sure if it's a typo or not. Edit. Thank you to all the people who explained it. I now know what it means, that it's bow as in elbow, uh, and it was not a typo. Bow up to. Flex on him or stand up to him. Ah, I'm going to commit. I'm getting a bow flex. Have a cop friend that had someone proclaim they were a sovereign citizen, and he responded, That's fine, because I happen to have sovereign handcuffs that I'm going to put on you for your ride in my sovereign police car down to the sovereign jail. 
I understand, sir. Let me switch into my sovereign police officer uniform to make sure this is by the book. Puts on Burger King crown. I would have paid to see that exchange. I mean, if you're a glutton for punishment, there are whole playlists of sovereign citizens trying to apply their nonsense when pulled over. I'm starting to think that their nonsense is made with the intention of making cops, judges, and prosecutors want to give up and just let them go. <laughs> yeah, wonder how that's working out so far. There was a sovereign sit a lot on YouTube a couple of days ago at a Zoom hearing. At a prior hearing, the judge held him in contempt and ordered him to the county jail for 30 days. He showed up for the scheduled hearing, and the first thing the judge asked him was why he was not in the county jail as ordered. He said he did not consent to being jailed. There was a public defender at the hearing. She asked the judge to go into a breakout room with the idiot. When they came back, the sovereign city stopped all his gibberish and wanted to plead guilty to his traffic offenses and pay the relevant fines. The judge said nothing was going to happen until he surrendered himself to the county jail and served out his contempt sentence. The public defender did her best, but the judge was making a point. He literally told the guy if he wasn't at the county jail by 5 p.m., the sheriff's department would come and get him, and he'd end up serving more time for another contempt charge. The public defender did her best, but I don't believe the idiot turned himself in. Hopefully, one of the court watch channels does an update on him. I've always thought that that sovereign citizen stuff, and I've seen a lot of them, was just to waste people's time. I think it's just these people just fast-talking their way out of just getting a ticket or anything. I figure if you just string along these words for just so long that everyone will just, okay, whatever, just go away. And unfortunately, I think that works for some people. Story two. No, I'm not. Cop here. This is the scariest answer. When people say nope or just no, it never ends well. Those folks are going to run, fight, or just do some wild stuff. One guy said nope and immediately took off his shirt. Edit. Folks are asking what wild stuff means. Well, often a common response to you're under arrest, and I don't know why, is they start daring me to hurt them. It's usually some psychosis or illicit substances playing a part that sometimes people say things like, No, I'm not. Go ahead. Shoot me. Unalive me. Then I go, Dude, you have a warrant for your arrest. Please, just go with the program. No one wants to hurt you. No? You want to taser me? Ah! It's a thing lately. It's a common phobia. Not sure. Edit 2. The guy that took off his shirt punched me in the face. Paramedic here. Same with psych or illicit substance patients when you're trying to corral them into the ambulance. All right, we're going to head to the ambulance now. No. The situation immediately begins to escalate every single time. At least he ensured good probe contact. When a shirt comes off, you know something is getting serious. More anecdotes on this, please? Describe wild stuff. I once chased a guy who broke into my restaurant after closing bang him up and down the street until cops arrived, which I immediately backed off when they arrived and were close enough to grab him. He managed to give me the old slip, and they chased him from there all the way to him climbing up a light pole. They tased him, and he fell. Two weeks later, he walked by the restaurant and waved through the glass while smiling at our little cute 24-year-old front-of-house manager who had been the one he saw alone in the dining room when he decided to jump straight through a pane of glass in his boxers, jeans in hand, and tried to chase her. I guess that's one way of trying to get out of getting arrested, just saying nope and denying the whole thing. I had phrases like that when I was driving rideshare that I knew when someone uttered it. The situation was not going to go as planned. It just wasn't. Story three. Long story short, but one time a couple of guy friends came to my house in the middle of the night during a snowstorm after they had run away from home. One of the guys was the son of our town's police chief. 
The other guy had an actual rap sheet as a teenager and had been to juvie a couple times. Anyway, because they made a call from my house, the police showed up. They brought the chief's son outside and had the other kid, Juvie, in handcuffs in my living room. Just me, Juvie, and like five cops sitting in silence, waiting for my dad to get out of the shower so the police could talk to him. Juvie is sitting with his head kind of down, staring at the floor, and cuts the silence by starting to slowly sing, <laughs> Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? <laughs> and one of the cops shoots him a look. And he, Juvie, gets a huge smile on his face and laughs. The same cops turn and look at me, and I realize I had a big grin on my own face. I quickly bit the inside of my cheeks and stared down at the floor myself. <laughs> rap sheet? It's not spelled W-R-A-P, rap sheet. It's R-A-P. Record of Arrest and Prosecution. Rap. Criminal History. Today I learned I had no idea rap sheet was an acronym. For those of a certain age, you have no idea. When that song Bad Boys came on, you knew you were getting your fix of cops chasing people down, usually shirtless. This was way before YouTube. Our fix was the show Cops. Do you have no idea? Story four. Yes, Daddy. I had an officer check my belt area during an investigatory detention. I said, I always wanted a strong man in uniform to give me a reach. That officer would not make eye contact with me the rest of that investigation. We got stopped at a check stop leaving a campsite a couple years ago. Myself and my buddy both had weed on us, so they asked us to step out of the car. It's legal in Canada, but can't be within reach of the driver. We didn't know that at the time. One of my buddies doesn't smoke, so therefore didn't have any weed on him. The cop didn't believe him pointed to a bulge in his pants and asked, So what's that? My buddy hummed and hawed for a minute, so the cop decided to pat him down. He grabs the bulge, and my buddy finally blurts out, Um, that's my tool? The look on the cop's face almost had me in tears. I was laughing so hard. That's just a traditional Canadian way of greeting someone. The recipient is then supposed to say, Eh? That cop knows his judo well. What is the charge for enjoying a meal? A succulent Chinese meal. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.